Hello everybody and welcome back to the Two Nowries podcast. I'm your host James and I'm joined as always by my good friend Timmy Long. Hi everyone. Sean is on the light and sound. How are you Sean? Not too bad. Going to have to come up with a catchphrase for Sean. Leave it with me, <laughs> leave it with me. You think about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And we have a Waterford, Wexford lady in the hot seat. <laughs> Doctor, Doctor Rebecca Brennan. I know, I know some. Thanks for having me. You don't have to call me that, though. I'll just call me. Yeah. I actually didn't know that myself, dear. I didn't know there was. Uh, well, sometimes, fair play. sometimes academics and be oh, don't call me doctor, but you work fucking really hard to get that, and I think it's appropriate, especially when we're going to be talking about your work you're doing. It's funny, like when you get it, when you get past the stage of getting the PhD, you you move into a space where everyone has one. So it's not as important anymore. Like that's because yeah. you're <laughs> hanging around with the right people. So is it? <laughs> but you know what I what I notice in my work? Yeah. Sometimes, usually, people in the public sector, they'll put on the little letters after their name. Mm. There's no like yeah. uh, humility there. Like if the they've studied it, it's going on. It. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. it's not, maybe we're a bit too humble. Maybe, maybe. we should fucking be. When I first ourselves. got my PhD, I used to do that. I got, you know, it was exciting to me, obviously. You know, it obviously gave gave me a thrill to get it. Yeah, it felt like a huge achievement. But as the years have gone by now, I've lost interest in the fact mm. that I have it, and now I don't re- use it much at all. Like you know, so use it when you're booking hotel rooms because they do up the. the oh yeah, if I'm making a complaint yeah. about something, yeah. I throw it in. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, what about Twitter? Would you put it on Twitter? I have it on Twitter, yeah, but most most academics have it on Twitter, so I just yeah. kind of followed their lead. I didn't have any social media for years. It was actually Sharon Lambert that convinced me mm-hmm. to get a Twitter. So really, shout out to Sharon for, for yeah. putting me on that. Yeah. Um, I didn't I didn't have one when I first started working for UCC at all, and I was kind of told, listen, you have to have one. You know, you have to promote your publications, and it's you know for your own sake, not because they're forcing you in any way, but. Just for your own sake, get yourself out there. Yeah, because it is a yeah. medium for disseminating your work, but it it's is. also a great medium for connecting with people. Yeah. And um, we've got job opportunities, and we've yeah. got great guests. I've just got shit. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't last long on Twitter, was you? I just got shit. So I said, "Fuck." I thought it was funny actually. I did get it one time. I ca- I don't know what I commented on, but this somebody commented underneath it. Oh, go and do your fucking research, girl, would you? And somebody said, yeah. check her bio, I you? know, <laughs> I know. I tried to keep my Twitter, ex- my Twitter at the moment now is very quiet, and I just kind of keep it around sport, and I try to stay away from the politics and the social stuff because you just get fucking roasted on it. Mm. Like, it doesn't matter what you say or how well your argument is, there's going to be somebody there to give a shit about it. And yeah. you're, like... What are you actually going to gain out of engaging with somebody like that? I don't understand it. It can be very just, negative. I place, just like. don't understand why someone would waste so much of their time. precious time yeah. on something like that. And now this is just me, and start giving out about other people who are really trying to change the world by doing research. Yeah, you know, but it's just p- pathetic people have nothing else going on in their lives. They create a fake account with a fake name and a fake profile picture and give shit to people. And I that just makes think them that there's a lot, there must be a lot of chaos going on in their head though. And there, that's the a reflection loneliness. of that. Like if you want peace of mind, you're going to behave in a peaceful way towards other people to maintain that. But if you if you've got chaotic chaos and chaotic things going on in your head, then that's going to be communicated to the world in whatever way it's communicated. Yeah. And if you're online typing away to complete strangers, insulting them like. Mm. You know, that's really... There's not very much that, awareness like. there, really, is there? Yeah. But you know, if you're at home and you're lonely, bitter, um, and there's no interaction on your phone, let's say now we put out a podcast mm. or you put out a publication, whatever, and next your phone starts buzzing with positive, you know, oh, great podcast, love the paper, you know, that's great. Some people, they never get that type of interaction. But you know, when they put out, when, when they give shit, and then people come in to back you up, then their phone is buzzing. So it's like, it's negative attention they're getting, but at least they feel like they're important. No, that's what I think, anyway. Yeah. It's like, it's the only time they'll get the... I likes. actually feel sorry for them, if that's the wrong yeah, thing to they, do. They, they, you know, like, 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 there's something going on for them and they probably can't see it themselves. Yeah. Well, would you like to occupy that miserable space? I know, that's I true. Know I wouldn't, anyway. You know? Do you know, the worst thing you can do is care about what other people think about you or what you... You know what I mean? That's yeah. one of the most pointless things you can do. Well, the road to Dr. Rebecca wasn't 
a linear or no. straightforward. No, not we go, at all. We go right back. Do you tell us a little bit where you're from and where you grew up and what it was like? Um, I am from a small enough town called New Ross in County Wexford. The JFK connection there, wasn't there? Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, he waved at my grandmother when he was passing through that time, and he <laughs> Go apparently out, uh. he fancied her. Yeah, according to her. So. <laughs> <laughs> the play at all? Yeah, yeah. So there was um, there are two of us, me and my sister. You're lucky they didn't call you Jackie. <laughs> my gosh, Jack is not an old Jackie. Jackie's a lovely My name. Uncle's yeah. name is Jackie. What did for the, for the, his wife? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. JFK's wife was Jackie. Like, yeah, yeah. She was beautiful, too. But go on, Anya, sorry. <laughs> no, you're grand. <laughs> um, so, my dad was a joiner, which is like a carpenter, but, it, you know, as, as, look, he killed me if you heard me now. I can't even tell you what a joiner is. I can. It's something, can you? I'm a carpenter oh, joiner. Oh, are you? Yeah. Okay, grand. Yeah. <laughs> but he was also a musician. He's a drummer. Yeah. Something interesting. You know Maverick Sabre, the yeah. the uh, musician. His dad, Victor Stafford, was actually in the band with my father. So oh, very um, good. that's my little claim to fame there. Because, mm-hmm. you know, Maverick Sabre from New Ross. His yeah. real name is Mick Stafford. So his father, Victor, is in the band with my dad. Wasn't so. he found, Maverick Sabre found Buskin or something like that? I don't know, actually. Uh, I think he had an interesting background that way. I don't know, kind of from the gutter then to he an amazing voice. But go on anyway, because we'll digress. He does have an unreal voice. Yeah. Yeah, I love his music. Did you go to school? I did go to school, yeah. What was it like? Um, primary school wasn't too bad. Um, I think I got through primary school pretty okay. Um, I was severely bullied in secondary school. Severely bu- bullied. Like Secondary school would have been... Probably one of the worst times of my life. Like, um, I Wait. look very different to the rest of my family, so I was bullied about that. Um, I was bullied because I was called a SWAT. I was bullied because I wore glasses. That stopped me wearing glasses for 25 years, but I actually went in and got, got a pair the other day. Go I'm very proud <laughs> that, yeah. I, that I went and did that, but uh, that had a long lasting effect on me. Um, so I, I didn't have many friends. Like, how, how did you, you know? cope with the bullying? Um, did you withdraw? Or... Initially, I suppose, yes. But my behaviour became very bad, um, you know, as time went on in school. Um, I suppose I was just looking for attention. I don't know what I was at, really. Trying to Probably trying to impress people that I thought were cool and they might like me then if I did these things, these troublesome things in class. So as it turned out... Um, for a combination of reasons, I ended up changing schools after my junior cert and going to Waterford. But there was a lot in there that I skipped out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was born. I was born under. At the time, w- would have been considered very scandalous circumstances. Like I was born outside of my parents' wedding, or uh, my parents' marriage. Excuse me. So that was well known in the town and in a town like New Ross. I mean, you know, they thrive on, small towns thrive on that kind of stuff. Mm. So um, I wasn't I wasn't aware that my dad wasn't my biological dad until I was 14. I knew, I had an instinct, something in me was telling me that there was something wrong. Not wrong, but there was something different about me. Um, it still amazes me to this day how I could possibly have picked up on that because daddy never made me feel any different at all. Do you know what I mean? He didn't do anything different to, to make me feel that way. But if I saw anything on television, like if it's, if EastEnders was on or Fair City or whatever was on at the time, whatever was popular, and there was people having an affair, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to handle that. Like from a very young age, mm. three, four, I'd put my hands over my ears. Like, mm. so how, that's still to this day, I can't understand yeah. how that would have, but like my theory on it is when I was in the womb, maybe I absorbed all the stress yeah. that was going on around me, around that, what was happening, you know. Um, but, you know, my parents married extremely young in comparison to the age that married people get married now. Like, I'm nearly 40, I'm not married. Um, I don't know if I ever will be. It's, it wasn't like that then. People mm-hmm. were nearly kids when they were getting married. So things like that happened. Like, my mother was 17. She got pregnant by my dad, who was 24. And back in those days, you kind of had to get married, yeah. or it was the mother and baby. Mm, the mom. Yeah. And that's what happened. Like, and yeah. or, or, or go to England. The option of leaving kind of isn't there. Like, mm. do you know what I mean? So, like, I understand. I, I understand how 
uh, that that happened. But for me, um, I was told when I was 14 and the, re the only reason I was told was because one of my friend's mothers rang up my mother to give her the heads up that their friend, my friend group were talking about it and that they might tell me and um, that one might not be the best way for me to oh, find no. out. So she, I was sat down and told and, and um, do you know, when I look back, I'd say, Timmy, with your interest in spirituality, like I know Martin Duffy, he's an Irish shaman up in Dunderry. I don't know if, you, if you've heard of him, but I've been up to see him a few times, but he talks about soul losses. It's like when you leave yourself, and I feel like that was my first soul loss in life because when my mom was explaining to me the situation, I totally abandoned myself and what I was feeling in that moment so that I could try and make sure that she didn't get too upset because I could, I could totally feel how uncomfortable mommy was and how afraid she was that I would be hurt. And I, I totally abandoned my own feelings in that moment to tell her it was fine that I kind of already suspected it, that it was all right and didn't affect me at all. Do you know, so I tried to keep the conversation as short as possible. But... Um, How did you feel though? Oh, sure. I I remember hearing my father come in the gate. Like he, he my father was very fond of a drink. Um, so he'd, he'd be out quite a few nights during the week. But I remember hearing him come through the gate. And when I heard the gate open, I started crying then. It was like as if, for him mm. more than myself but um yeah it was it was it was very very traumatic but squashed under the carpet mm. do you know what i mean yeah. um is that why you were bullied in school I, I it was brought up a few times yeah do you know but I, like looking back it was said to me in primary school but i had no idea why what people were saying to me like people used to call me gypsy and uh, you know all these kind of these, those kind of derogatory. But you're very slurs. exotic looking. <laughs> so we kind of you probably always were exotic looking even as a child. Well, if I had my phone, I'd show you the screensaver. I'm on my granddad's lap, and I look <laughs> look a little. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I always had really dark hair and kind of sallow skin, like yeah. you know. But um, yeah, they did they did say things like that to me in primary school, but I had no clue why. I had no idea. Um, and for a child to be yeah. getting that kind of stuff and not understanding it, it, it can be one of the most difficult things grow, growing up. It was odd. It was an odd thing because I remember being in my nanny's house like that when she was alive, God rest her, like my, my dad's mother. And a relative came in, or maybe he wasn't a relative, maybe he was a friend of our, our family, I don't know, but he came in and he pointed straight at me and said, she's not a Brennan. I think I must have been about three or four because the only reason I'm guessing that age is because it never occurred to me to ask why or to say mm. anything. I just kind of sat there like, you know, mm. kind of dumbfounded. And my father's brother came straight in and said, don't you ever say anything like that again to that child. Do you know, to, to to stick up for me, I suppose. Yeah, you know, that's like, that's and nice. I do that remember warms your back I, up then Yeah, again, like. I do remember that well. Like that is something that that um I never thanked him for because well I suppose if he hears this now I can thank him now. It was never discussed again after I was told. Like mm. very rarely. Um so it wasn't a topic up for discussion. So then I, that that happened when I was fourteen and then I, I almost in parallel to that, um I started a part-time job. Um, I won't say where, but like it was supposed to be a good thing for me. I think my mother sensed I was starting to go off the rails a little bit, um, and she wanted. Well, I know that I know that's why she wanted me to go get a little job for myself, and it might put me on the straight and narrow. And she thought it'd be good for me, but unfortunately, after I I don't know the exact period of time, but somewhere between when I started that position. And maybe months later, weeks later, um, the owner of that business and that my, my employer started to sexually assault me or, or rape me at that age. So that went on for about, I'd say, two years. And um, so that was another. Did you ever tell anybody? I told a family member, yeah. But um, I think 
either I didn't communicate it very well or uh, it was misunderstood as to what exactly I was saying or perhaps I, don't, I can't speak for the other person and why, why nothing was done about it but um, I know that's something that that person regrets very much at, at, at this point in time you know um, and how did it end? Did you just leave the job? And um, I put up with it for about for I'd say just under two years, and then I think I just came came to the age where I, I just thought, "Fuck this! I don't want this anymore. Like I hate this. Like why am I?" Before that, it was more like, um, "If I go along with this, and just try and keep myself as safe as possible." and try and let it happen as little or as less often as possible, then I can survive this somehow. Because I didn't really think about how, how, how I couldn't see how I could get it out of it, like. Well, how, this person, did they have some form of threat over you at this point, or were they? No, not really, but he used to tell me things about my parents, like say, yeah. like, my parents obviously don't love you, like your father is in the pub, and you know, did, you know he used to tell me things like that. I, I told my mother that recently, and she, I was, like, she was absolutely furious over it. Um, that was his way of manipulating. Was, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and very much psychologically tried to mm. convince me that oh, he was the only person that cared about me, and I would have been very vulnerable at that time anyway because of school and the other the other situation. Um, so it, I was an easy target, really. Like. And he's your boss. And yeah. you're relying on him for There's a power imbalance. Yeah, oh, savage. Yeah. Just a pure predator, like. Yeah. And I do remember walking, because he used to keep me out late, way past when I was supposed to be home. And um, I do remember leaving the premises that one night, and an older man, I would say he would have been about 70, because he had a walking stick. It's a long time ago now, but I do remember it very well, shouting across the road saying, I know what you're doing to that young girl. I know what you're doing. So there must have been some people with eyes on it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But but nothing ever. It's a shame nobody yeah, acted. It is a shame. It is a shame. To think about many other girls did he come across in his lifetime. Though. Yeah. I don't think I can talk about that side of things. Because um, yeah. there's, there's any... ongoing leaking. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So you're you know, very brave to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, do you know what, Timmy? Like I, I've had, I've had um, since I was twenty three. I've been in and out of therapy. Like so, these are things that I've processed. Um, these are things, and as as I said to James on the phone the other night, you know, like the first thing people will say when you tell them something like that is always, oh, "I'm sorry." Like I'm really sorry, and I suppose that is the right thing to say. But for me, like I was, I'm not giving that man another minute in my life. Mm. No. Do you know? So I don't think about it. You know, it might it might float through my head like a cloud, like, but it passes through. Mm. And there might be some emotion attached to it. But yeah. You can let that go as well. Yeah. And that's the healing process. Yeah. That's how we heal. Yeah. Because you don't have to be a victim forever. You know? No. Well, no. You know, you're letting it go and you're getting on with your life. Yeah. That's that's an amazing place to be. So that's how I ended up leaving the Ross. That's yeah. an amazing. Yeah, I had to get out of there. Do you know when you're in a, a situation, and I don't want I'm not going to dwell on the fact, no, but if you're in a situation where there's lots of what we would now know as adverse childhood experiences, did you start experimenting in your teenage years oh, yeah. with substances? Oh, yeah. I totally, totally immersed myself in the party scene for years. Like, I mean, that, that when I say I did not think about the fact to think about either of those traumatic events until I got hit about 21 from that from when I left Niras I mean I did not think about them mm. it's like as if I just <laughs> forgot they ever happened and I went out and I had like I had a whole new group of friends because I went I moved to Waterford so I went started going to a Waterford base school I it was a totally different environment environment for me the friends I hooked up with were party heads and I had an absolute blast, <laughs> absolute as you, ball. As you would. <laughs> and you deserved yeah. it at that stage. Yeah. yeah. But I, I yeah. suppose when, when, when you're, you're that age and you're partying and you're getting so much pleasure from the partying, you know, because it's, it's, it's releasing whatever's going on for you, for you emotionally and your, your thoughts, you're not going to think about anything else. You're going to be thinking about how you're going to get money for that next party. <laughs> That's it. You're only working you know? to... Like, I mean, the only... I mean, I would have had... 
at that stage in my life, I would have had quite, um, like the job, different jobs to say that, that I have now, very different. Any job would have done me. I just had to get to Friday, like, that was it. You know, just give me my pay packet mm. and I know what I'm going to spend it on. Like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And it's gone by yeah. Sunday night. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like, as you know, then obviously I fell pregnant very early too. So I was 18 when I was fell pregnant on my first child. So that slowed, slowed everything down a little bit, um, obviously. And um, I stayed with their dad for five and a half years. So I had a second child at the age of 22. Let me do the maths now, because mm, it was four 2005. Years. So was I 22 or 23? Whatever, I was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, life life then slightly different. Like, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't I didn't stop going out like do you know what I mean? Like, we we still did we still continued on as much as we could when we had the opportunity. And my mother was brilliant. Like when I had the kids small, she'd take them all the time, way too much. She should never have had to do that. It wasn't her responsibility, but I was extremely selfish, like at that age. You know, all I wanted to do was have a good time. And those are like, if I had to, I always say I regret nothing. But when I look back at the at the early years of being a mother, I regret not being better. Do you know what I mean? Not being a better, better person, a better parent, more present. But the, 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 yeah. the experience you had, um, like on the surface might look, or there's a selfish mom out party and neglecting the kids. Um, but maybe like, with the experiences you had, you're just you're you're trying to block that out till you get to the stage where you're actually mature enough to deal with it. And sometimes the children can get caught in the crossfire of that, mm. your, in spite of your best intentions, you know. I I, I, I can completely relate to. You. Yeah. I missed the first four years of my small for his life, and like when 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 my daughter was four, I was the apple of her life at, until she was four, and then all of a sudden I'm taking over her life, yeah. and. I can still see the see that today, you know. Yeah. I was gone for for three years. Then, like he was eight months when I left, but I wasn't there when he was around. You know, I was caught up in addiction, and like today, I've I've often spoke to him about it, the two of them, you know, and uh, particularly my daughter because, yeah. like, the bond we had at that point when I left, like, it was Jesus Christ. She used to lock onto my leg. You know, me and my wife today were we were only together back then and it was such a crazy environment, right? She could never have me around the kids because I was fucking off the rails mad. But when the child would catch me, she'd lock onto my leg and my heart used to break. Yeah. You know, it, it was it was yeah. and I can like but when we go on, you know, we understand what we do today, you know, and we, 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 like, as James said it perfectly there, he says, you know, you were really trying to deal with a lot of stuff at the time, and as we mature, unfortunately, men mature later, <laughs> yeah. you know. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, uh, my eldest child, my son would have been about four, and my daughter would have been about 10 months old when I left her dad. That was a very turbulent relationship. There was a huge age difference there, but he was a lot older than me. So it was quite unhealthy. Like there was a lot of fighting, there was a lot of chaos in the home. Um, thank God now we ha our relationship is, is peaceful. We co-parent very well. So I'm grateful for that, like, you know, that all that was resolved. But at the time, um, I would have left him at that, at that stage. So, I ended up um, on my own with the lads from that point on as a single mother. Like, were they boy, girl, two girls? Boy, girl. Boy and my girl. eldest is a boy, my youngest is a girl. Twenty and seventeen. That's how old they are now. So how did you how did you go down the education route? How did that come about? Well, I, I like I have a vivid memory of being in. Like, I got, got a council house. Like, do you know? So I was in a council house, and um, I remember. Maybe maybe I was 24, maybe I was 25 at this stage. I remember looking around. I got a gorgeous house and I was grateful for it. I'm not saying it wasn't good enough for me, right? Yeah. That wasn't it. But I was on lone parents. 
and I just thought, is this it? Like, you know, is is this is this all all I'm gonna do? Like, is there anything else I can do, not just for me to progress, but I want I want to set a good example for the t- for the lads, like, mm. you know, and I, when I say the lads, I mean the kids, like. Yeah. You know, I'm I, at the time like I was, I was a single parent, so I was kind of like, it's, t- it's up to you. Like, this is up to you. You've got to, you've got to pick something now and 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 make and make a change. So, what I the reason I picked the course that I picked. Um, when I was very young, like I was wa- used to watch this show called Intervention. I don't know if you have ever seen it. It's a, it's a U.S. based program. Now I don't agree with it at all. Now, looking back, the tactic they used to use, but that wasn't why I used to like it. I like it. It's, it the fo- program basically focuses on a person who is experiencing the addiction of all, any kind in their life. And it, it, it focuses on their family as well. And then they all come into a room and read them a letter as to how, you know, your addiction has affected me in the following ways. But what I used to love about the program, or not love about it, but what, what used to... Uh, to attract me to it was the pain in their eyes like the people that were in addiction and I think with the maturity and the kind of knowledge that I have now I realised that's because I could relate to that mm. and I wanted to do something to help people that were going through that you know that desperation you see it in someone's eyes you know you see sort of the hopelessness like the feeling of like Jesus Christ will you show me a way out of this hell like do you know um, and I really I, I watched it obsessively like do you know I'd, I'd never missed an episode and then I'd re-watch it and re-watch it and re-watch it so that's that was my main interest or my, the main reason outside I suppose my own experiences to go and, and pick that um, addiction studies addiction studies I did I ended up doing a degree in addiction counselling and then I ended in up Waterford. in in, in Watford, yeah. And um, I did very well. I got I got a first and I, I got a first in class. Congratulations. Uh, thanks a million. What was it like being a student and a mum? Uh, hard. Yeah. I remember the classes were at night, so I remember lifting my the, the amount of the car asleep, like, because I'd, yeah. I'd drop them to a, ch- a friend's house, you know, to mind them from six to ten. And I'd be after, I got a, dro- a job in a creche, actually. Mm. Um, I was in counselling in the, in a, in a subsidised counselling place in Waterford called St Bridget's, and they got me a CE scheme, which was down in a crash that was just down from where they were, and they said, "Look, that'll be the best job for you, because when you're when they start going to school, you can just work the mornings in there in your CE scheme, and it'll all work together. It'll fit fit in well with you." And that's how I got my foot in the door there. So I was working, but then I had the cl- the classes as well. So yeah, I used to. Ca- I remember carrying them both in, both the both of them would be asleep, and I'm sure that wasn't great for them either. Like you know, um. But you're thinking the long term goal here. Yeah, that's what I was. Yeah, yeah, but having to pay for that degree, like nobody ever fully believes me. But this is the absolute one hundred percent truth. I worked out an agreement with the people who were running that 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 course, and it wasn't WIT. WIT were just hosting it. So there was a crowd that were that were um, running the course in WIT, using it as a venue, say. And I worked out an agreement with them that I could pay my fees a hundred euro a week. So we survived on about a hundred and ten euro a week for four years. Me and my kids after that. Because the course wasn't a WIT course, you couldn't get Susie Grant. You can't get Susie for post for for part-time courses oh, okay. i don't know has that changed no, now right. i don't yeah. think I, I think it's the same do you know what it's a huge barrier for it is they, need to, they need to look at it again especially for yeah. for moms and people that have to work yeah oh yeah but you you know what you achieved there right <laughs> like that in its own right is it's unbelievable unbelievable like oh but sure timmy look i'm not i i'm not i'm not ashamed to say like yeah. i we survived on on food vouchers from saint vincent oh, Paul for years i know and like I used to beg them, please don't give me super value ones, because if I went to super value, like there would be, you know, when you gave the vouchers, my face would be going purple with embarrassment, like, you know, with the big cube behind you, and 
people people at the cash register are really kind of looking at you as if to say they know you got it off the Vincent. we can do for you know, I'm not knocking super value you know, I shop there every week I know, now but do you know when you know gross though right do yeah. you know when you know gross in yourself do you know that situation back then right it was it, it was shame for but yeah. if I was handed super value vouchers right now, I'd go up to the shop. No one would use them, no bother. I would now. I oh, I would now. Do you know what I mean? But I think I, at yeah. that, like I was still very young, Tim, very young. Like I know people say, well, people know now that your prefrontal cortex is not fully developed till the age of 25, but our brain continues to grow through our whole life mm. at a slower pace. And I would have been, looking back, quite immature for my age anyway. Do you know what I mean? And I was alone. I felt alone anyway. So to deal with that kind of, I always felt if I had the child in, in a buggy and, and he started crying, that everyone in the whole place would be was thinking, what a terrible mother I must be, that I can't settle him, you know? So there was f- the food vouchers and the Vincent Paul helped me out a lot, a lot, I have to say. They helped me too when yeah. I was going through my degree in Newton Community Work. Susie would only give half the fees because I'd stayed in my mum's house for one of the previous five years, which was a fucking ridiculous rule, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like go up and ask your mum for three grand, you know. It's just <laughs> money, <laughs> money in recovery about nine months, like that's not <laughs> 20, 28, 27, 28. But that's basically what they say because you're assessed if you've stayed in your family home for one of the previous five years, mm-hmm. you're not assessed as an independent adult, even though I was living in a, a house yeah. belonged to the Simon. They were so, but Vincent DePaul really helped me pay the fees. They do. You know, and different NGOs and charities as well, and a bit of work here and there. But I suppose the point I want to make is, you did what you had to do. Do you know what I mean? There's all these obstacles in the way, but you're like, right, how do we navigate this? We feel the shame, but we'll do it. I'm telling you, I, be, I became the best problem solver of all time. Yeah. Because when you're broke, e- everything is more expensive. Like, I know not, like that sounds like an oxymoron, but... If you have to buy something on higher purchase, like you kind of come up with the money up front. I had provident loans up to my ears, credit union loans up to my ears. I owed everyone money. Like, do you know, it was, and that lifestyle is, is stressful. Mm. But when it come, and I, I, I can't stress this enough that I, there were times I, like where I, I didn't have money to go in and get like bread and milk. Like I'd have nothing in my pocket, mm. do you know? So they were very, very, high stress times like do you know what's a horrible feeling do you know when you're in the queue in the supermarket and you're looking at the items and, and counting it up and as it goes past yeah. yeah. if I don't have enough here the anxiety that would be up rising up, up. Yeah, oh yeah. I remember what I'd that's like i have to put a few things back yeah and the yeah. shame of that and you're trying yeah. to put them back <laughs> you're trying to do the calculation <laughs> in your head you know so yeah. you don't get shamed at the thing yeah, yeah. but that's actually do you know what do you know when you get your the big job in UCC you now and stuff like that is you, you remember what that's like and, and that's, you know, you, you I'll some, never forget that's it that's important yeah. I'll never forget it but uh, like when I eventually so anyway t- I finished my degree there was a year in between where the credit union just would not give me a lo- I had a really good mentor one of my lecturers um, um, Mary Claire Van Hout is her name she kept telling me I was PhD material like she kept telling me that and telling me that over and over again so she just said, if you can just get your four grand together, you know, we'll, we'll set you up on a program. But I couldn't get that money together. The whole year, the credit union wouldn't give it to me. And I remember absolutely going mental on one of them over the phone one day, sitting in the car, saying, but how can I get more? How can I get a good job? And how can I get more money if you won't help me now? Like, just because mm. I can't save, like, you yeah. know, and I couldn't understand why it, was, why it would be so hard. But then I was lucky enough to get a scholarship. So you must be, you must be very very smart. Yeah, like, well, well, what first class? First, yeah, you must be. I don't know. I, like when anybody says anything to me about me being clever or smart, I put it down to hard graft. Mm. I mean, you can be as clever as you want. That that's smart. Do you, but like you have to work. Like look, when I look at James, I look as intelligent. Like he's yeah. he's yeah. smart. He's he. I know. tell you about an interaction I had today. Yeah. Do you know Sinead O'Neill? Yes. She was the mature student officer on the yeah, CT. She's in well. UCC now. Yeah. And the, you know, I met her today in the, outside the electrical shop, right? And we were talking about this. And I was like, in when I did the criminology masters, I got a first class honours. And each of the modules, I aced them all, it was 75 or, and nearly all of them. Because I was in there under a scholarship, I felt like I had to prove myself. Mm. But I, 
it's not that I felt like I was way more intelligent than everybody else in the class. Just I read the material I was supposed to be reading. And when I got an essay, I started it. And I was just proactive about it. And I, you know, there was that struggle. They weren't doing the basic stuff of reading. And they were coming into class on TikTok, Snapchat or whatever. So I, I think that there's a mix between you have a natural flair for it, but there's also open the laptop, open the book and put the hours in. But you, you also yeah. have uh, one of these brains that retains information really well. And when when you even when he's listened to audio books, like he can hold it after listening to it once. Yeah. Whereas me, I'd have to watch the same thing 50 times and I still won't recite it. <laughs> you know, uh. but when I listen to him, like reciting stuff that we could have done a podcast last year and he'll recite word for word what somebody said and I said what I'm sitting there where the fuck does he get these this from but it goes back to the thing uh, some people are uh, academic they take to the academic easy some people take to the technical stuff a little bit better some are more like um, what's that guy the nine types of intelligence you know it's like some people are musical some people have great spatial awareness and some people are I mean, it's visual. Yeah it's, yeah, it's it's visual, and it's it's with my hands when I when I see something being done first first time off with my hands, I can do it. No yeah, problem, yeah, just once. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that's I'm dyslexic as well, so that's one of the the strengths I have with being dyslexic. Yeah, yeah. you know. Well, that's what universal design for learning is all built around. It's like making everything accessible to everybody. You know, it's in recognition of the fact that that um, we're all so, so unique in the way we learn. You know, it's a, they have that banking model of education where you just put information in someone's brain doesn't work for everyone. Wow. It'll work for some people, but unfortunately then other people get left behind, not because they're, you know, there's, there's anything wrong with their intelligence level or anything like that, but just because they learn in a different way. Yeah. So, um, There's no point in that. I the, you spoke about the scholarship there. Yeah. When I finished the bachelor's degree, I wanted to. M I was mad to do the criminology masters, but Susie, you know, and help you. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the bar for funding goes down, mm -hmm. so the household income is you have to be really under all to get the kind of long story. There was this Nigerian guy in my class, oh man, I name him, but uh, he's fucking sound. Yeah. You no, know, he he speaks really <laughs> aggressive, but he's always very kind. Yeah. How are, how are you? But he's, <laughs> he's trying to be nice, but that's just how they speak. <laughs> But he come over to me one day and the campus says, come on, James. I says, what are you doing? Come on. He was going to go over and pay the 6000 for me. Oh. Up front. He says, come on. He says, I know. He says, that you really want to do this? And I'm afraid in case that when you graduate, you go, you won't, you won't come back because mm. you go working. And I, say, and I was like, hold on. I said, because I have an application gone in for a scholarship and we'll see what happens. In the end, I got it, but I just wanted to give him a shout out there yeah, because yeah. he was That so is on the It's great, isn't it? Yeah. That's but you brilliant. got the scholarship too. Yeah, I, was, I remember when I got the call. Like I, had, I, I was lucky enough that I had that lecturer who she mentored me very, very closely. Like, And I got a few publications as an undergraduate. It was around the time when all the head shops were open. Yeah. So Magic they're the only, uh, as, as far as I know, in the Republic of Ireland, uh, those publications are the only ones that were published mm -hmm. at that time that, that we went out and, well, I did the field work, went out and interviewed people who'd taken those head shop drugs and just asked them about their effects and, yeah. and the papers got published. And I think that it was on the basis of that um, and the hard work that my supervisors put into helping me write the application yeah. um, that got me that scholarship. But did I remember the day I got the call, you know, those moments in life where you know things are never going to be the same again. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was one of those like um, I had to go out the back garden to take to get the reception because the reception in my house was still desperate to this day. <laughs> and I was walking around the garden and I was just thinking, this is the end of one chapter now and it's the beginning of another like mm. so. I continued to work in the creche while I was studying for my PhD, so that took another four years. But then I was very, very lucky again um, to get a position lecturing in Ancasson up in Dublin. So Ancasson is like, um, it's, a, it, it's a higher education institution. It's not, it's not technically recognised as a HEI, but it's, a higher edu it's higher education. They have degree courses and it's pathway out of poverty for people where is it you know um, it's in Tala oh, in Sharon, Jobstown Sharon, or, um, 
Lynn Rowan was telling us about that place. Yeah. We had Lynn yeah. Rowan on the podcast yeah. before. Was she come through that place? I, uh, yeah, that? I only know Lynn through social media, but I actually sent her a few wigs. Yeah. Like, I'd be big into wearing wigs sometimes, and she said she, <laughs> she said to me, I love that pink wig you have on your on Instagram. <laughs> so I sent her over a pink and a purple wig. She put a picture of herself up wearing it. I was delighted. Yeah, but I, but think, <laughs> she, she, I think her journey through education started through that course as well. Yeah, maybe. You'd actually yeah. get on very well. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, we do, we do it when, when yeah. we're in a conversation online. But, um, what was it like going up, working up there? I'll tell you, the first lecture I gave, it was... Between it was ten in the morning till four, in the after in the evening, and it was like an eight hour panic attack. That's <laughs> what it felt like because I'd never done anything like that before, and really I think the sweat was ripping off. Like when I look back, like but the thing about that is, and that's what I always say to my students now, like public speaking, a lot like most people are terrified of it. It's one of the biggest. Yeah fears that people have is getting up and speaking in front of people so the more you do it the easier it becomes and yeah. as long as you can be authentic and just be yourself you don't have to put on a voice like you don't have to like mm. I thought I had to put on maybe a slightly posher voice than I have like because mm. you're being a teacher now like yeah, you know so yeah. you, have to, you have to look like a teacher but yeah. going back to Lynn like Lynn Lynn came out uh, just recently and said if you're a working class don't assimilate yourself into a into that into a middle class culture, like you know, come as you are. Like you know, don't don't hide your tattoos. Like don't uh, or, you know, use your your own vernacular because we need representation in those spaces. Mm. And I really, really, re really um, agree with that. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, and I really hope that I live, or that I that I live my career in that way. So anyway, um, from Ancasan then. I got, um, I, I was just on as an exter external tutor panel at that stage, so I was still working in the creche. But then once I finished my PhD, I got the, a job offer for UCC. And I'll never forget when I closed the door on the creche for the last time, I bawled my eyes out. I How really long did you work in the creche? 10 years. And Go that ahead. was through your whole education? Yeah, yeah, my whole education. And like, you know, as much as it was a brilliant thing to be going ahead, you know, to be pushing on. This is what I worked for. This yeah. is what I wanted, you know. This is going to be more money for me and my kids. It was going to be. But I felt like I was saying goodbye to a part of myself. That's what I really felt like. Yeah. When I closed that door, I knew I'd never go in there again. Because all I used to do all day long is go. Like, there was like, so yeah. many friends in there. Yeah. Like, it was like going into a family, like, you know, like... But you're moving into the new era of your life now, new season. New season. When did yeah. when did that? Ha how long are you working in UCC now? Uh, I am in UC UCC just over four years. Okay, so that was yeah. four years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's it going for you? Brilliant. I love working there. Yeah. Um, I'm at the moment. I'm on the SOAR project, um, which is a project which looks to improve access to higher education for underrepresented groups. So it's like members of the traveller community. You have new communities, you know, single parent families. Mm. Yeah, anyone that's in, coming from a space where they were ostracized, marginalized, pushed out, yeah. and where getting into education was difficult for, made difficult, especially people from the traveler community, actually. Mm. Um, so those projects are of great interest to me. They're very close to my heart because it was difficult enough for me to get into that space yeah. myself. Um, so I love that work. And um, I'd also lecture for the adult continuing education um, department of UCC, which would be mature students. And a lot of those students would be from uh, com coming from a recovery background themselves. So I teach on the diploma for uh, substance use and misuse. I lectured for one of your classes. Yeah. And a lot of the students. No, that was a that was a short course called Oh, that was a short that yeah. was a good taster course though for people if they were thinking yeah. about not testing yeah. the waters. Yeah. They, but a lot of the people uh were watch the podcast and stuff like that and come from recovery backgrounds but well, sure you were the favorite i came back in the the week after he was on and, and they were going on about how great he was i was like what about me <laughs> <laughs> what's up with me like i'm here every week yeah <laughs> you sounded like someone from cork girls yeah, yeah. I, I got that yeah. as well You're the old cork cork comes out of yeah, when yeah. she gets a bit I serious <laughs> Well, listen, it's uh, too much, I'd say. Yeah, no, yeah. you see, I, I so, if I go to Dublin, I could start, like, I have such a hybrid of accents, because I lived in Dublin for three years as well. 
do you know and I teach in Dublin so I teach Dublin students I, I am definitely a hybrid of different places so yeah. why that's why my accent is hard to kind of pinpoint but you know no because you've given your story publicly um they're, they're going to get a little bit of insight, you know, because you're going to be the cool lecturer now, you know. Am I? Yeah, <laughs> I you, you probably I are already. Like, but I don't know thought I was already, to be honest. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> but they're going to know you a little bit more now. <laughs> and, and I think you're going to inspire women, other women, and, and men, but other, other women out there might be at home listening and watching this with kids, maybe on social welfare, thinking like that, uh, is this all there is for me? Maybe this, and maybe you'll spark something in there. I hope so. I think you're an inspirational woman. To be able to change your life, to actually have the strength with two children to get back into education and do what you've done. And like that's going to inspire many, many women, you know, to do the same thing, particularly when they think that everything is against them, you know, and they look at you and see what you've accomplished. I think that would be great. That would be great. I mean, you know, I try, to, I do try and, and drill that into my students heads like that you know just because it's hard doesn't mean it's impossible you know it might take a little bit longer yeah but it's that's fine too there's so yeah, many lessons to learn to put the years in it could be yeah. years like you know but it is it is definitely worth that struggle you know it's 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 worth that struggle sometimes i think the the biggest growth the biggest personal growth that you get is out of those t times when you're fighting against your social situation, your uh, socioeconomic situation or whatever's around you, what your relationships you're in, you're fighting against all these obstacles to try and better yourself. And it seems like it's never ending drudgery, but it does end like, and when it does end, it's never coming back. Do you know, so that's the brilliant thing about it. And so I never lose touch with what it's like for my students, how hard it is for them to show up to class, how hard it is for some of them to, to speak up in class. Do you know, to have the bravery to try and answer a question or try and, try and discuss a topic because it's so intimidating, like for some people. Do you know, and, and then I went into Cork Prison there, James, you, uh, you, you were in there too. A great, great bunch of lads. Like I really enjoyed that. Like I'm looking forward to going back in there too. Um, we're back in there, October and November. I'm in there November, yeah. Yeah, we were asking that in the last lecture, mm. yourself and another fellow that was organising the course, was, what you know, what, what worked well, what would you like more of? And they all said, want more Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> but they loved the content, but they wanted more, Rebecca. Yeah. But you know what? It's it not was the content at all, it's yeah. <laughs> Maybe a bit of both. <laughs> but you know what? In, so in that class, you yeah. fellas doing life sentences, fellas doing a few months, and everything in between. And you know what they have in common? They're all trying to learn. They're all trying to learn about addiction and about you know sociology of drugs and all this stuff that's all new to them, but it all affects them in their lives. And they're just getting a bit of an education around it. And everybody mm. deserves an education, no matter who you are. And there was a qu something you mentioned there. Sorry, James. Uh, you were talking about the the education journey. You know, when when you started off on that journey, did you have much belief in yourself at that at that period of your life? You know, in your in 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 my abilities, like yeah. or, or the fact that I'd ever in make your it. abilities or even making it. I I never I unshaken unwavering belief that I was going to finish, and I don't know where it came from, like I, like. I really don't. The only way, like when I reflect back over, it, like and I obviously I've talked I've talked about it in therapy a few times, so maybe I have a little bit more insight now than I would have had, say a couple of years ago, but because of the things that I experienced when I was younger, I became very self-reliant in terms of problem solving. Um, I became very independent and kind of, I suppose, less reliant on other people and other people's opinions of me or their expectations of me. If they had low expectations of me, that really didn't bother me at all. If they told me that something was going to be very difficult that wouldn't affect me that wouldn't put me off I was determined to finish that PhD and I mean I was determined and I hit many obstacles along the way but not once did I ever do I ever remember 
saying to myself, I might give this up. And you were probably just getting more and more confident because of the results you were getting. You know, when you get it's, results it's, it's like it's that. It's when you're doing a PhD, you get a lot of criticism. You know. You do. And, and that's, I don't know why the culture is like that, mm. you know. I suppose it is to build you up and, and the standard is so high that maybe it has to be like that. I don't know. Maybe it's changed since I did it. I don't know that either. But when I was doing it, it was very much like, this isn't good enough. Come back with something better. But Do academia you know? is a tough place to be. And yeah. it's very competitive as well. Do you know, like yeah. if uh, if you would put in an article, like there's one or two stories on Twitter that you come across. Peer say, review. Peer review. It's so they ruthless. Tend, they, they tend, they, it's peer review, but sometimes, let's say you, I'm peer reviewing your paper, and I read a paper, and then I, I give you feedback, say, you need to go away and read Dr. Rebecca Brennan's material, but you're the one, you're Rebecca Brennan. That happened to, to me once before. That did happen to me <laughs> once before. I thought it was the funniest thing I ever <laughs> I was like, maybe I should, maybe I've forgotten it now. This <laughs> no, but you could have 10 pages to, like telling you that your paper is shit and why it's shit. Like, you know, and so you'd have to develop a thick skin. Do you know, so like when it comes to self-belief, you have to, like that's something you really do have to have, like, you know. And I suppose that comes over time and it comes with with every adversity you overcome, your self-esteem and your your feeling of your own capa- your co- your own capacity to overcome adversity increases. So you know, like obviously there's 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 dips in it. You know, you know people. Everyone goes through hard times. Life is like a roller coaster, as Ronan Keaton once famously said. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, when you're, <laughs> it's a great philosopher. I know, yeah. <laughs> the great Ronan Keaton. Yeah, but um. Like, you know, so you'll have times when you're going to dip and you won't feel so sure. But overall, like, I think I love blind, uh, what Blind Boy uh, said in, him, in one of his podcasts where he said, you're better than nobody and nobody's better than you. And I keep that in my head all the time that we're all exactly the same. So if I experience fear, if I experience doubt, you can be sure there's other people in the room feeling exactly the same way. Do you know? So yeah, that's great, great way to finish the podcast. It's great, a little nugget inspired by Ron and Keaton and Blind Boy. <laughs> <laughs> My two heroes. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But you know what I was thinking when you were talking Poor about that? Blind Boy, no, don't actually. <laughs> Should I be even? No, we were on, we actually were on Blind Boy's podcast a few months ago. There, I he, heard he, that. He's yeah. live in Cork yeah. Country. He's a nice old fella. But you know what I was thinking? Do you know when I was uh, doing my course and probably you were doing yours? You're looking at it and you're thinking, right, there's five, six years college here. All these are saying, how am I going to get through it? And all what I was just saying to myself, you drop it. What's the alternative? What are you actually going back to? And that used to drive me on. It's like uh, the further I get in this course, the further away from that That's shithole. It. Do you know what I yeah. mean? And that yeah. was the motivation. And then when you get the graduation and then you get the job and you with little milestones, then it's like vindication, reward. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I never, a million miles away from that now. Yeah. But I think the but it is it's tough, it is the long slog, but it's so worth it. it yeah. Yeah. Shine. That's it. Did you enjoy yourself? I did. did. Great? Thanks for having me. No, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you. And thanks very much for coming on and sharing your story. You're welcome to me. Thank you. We we'll see everybody next week. Slaan. <laughs>